Each summer, my family and I make the eight-hour trek up to our favorite island, Nantucket. Six hours by car and two hours by ferry, it's always a hike, but well worth the journey to spend our weeks in the sun and by the ocean, 30 miles off the coast of reality. Nantucket is the definition of relaxation for us. We rot in the sand, drink champagne on the beach, and spend every waking moment on the water fishing. Our greatest struggle is agreeing on which restaurant to dine at on any given night. Despite the 400-year-old buildings and cobblestone streets, it's easy for my family and me to forget that Nantucket wasn't always just a summer paradise for hedonism and debauchery. It has a rich history that is often neglected. Just over two centuries ago, our tiny 47-square-mile island was the whaling capital of the world. The New England ecosystem allowed for an abundance of sperm whales whose natural oil was incredibly valuable for lighting lanterns. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, Nantucketers mastered the art of open boat whaling, violently spearing 60-foot whales offshore and siphoning their sperm oil into buckets. However, soon enough, the Nantucket whalers had depleted all sources of sperm whales in their region. They needed to expand beyond New England if they wished to maintain the title of masters of their industry. They began sending large whaling ships as far as the Cape Horn of South Africa on year-long voyages to conquer their 32-ton enemies and return to their tiny island to profit immensely. One ship named the Essex set sail off of Nantucket in August of 1819 for a two-and-a-half-year voyage to the western coast of South America. The Essex ventured around Africa and reached South America about a year after its departure. However, when the crew arrived in the South Pacific, they realized quickly that they were in a pocket of the ocean that lacked what they needed the most, whales. They spent nearly a week without seeing a single mammal except for each other. Until one night, on November 20th, 1820, they spotted a massive 85-foot sperm whale, larger than any that they had seen on their voyage to date. Unexpectedly, the whale began to swim directly toward the ship, increasingly picking up speed. The first mate, Owen Chase, prepared to harpoon it when it struck the side of the ship with immeasurable force. The entire crew was thrown across the deck, some flying into the dark ocean. The whale surfaced on the other side of the ship and rammed it once again, now crushing the bow. Stunned and horrified, the crew deployed their lifeboats and scavenged as much food, water, and navigational gear that they could. By the next morning, the ship was completely submerged. Twenty sailors, three small boats, two thousand miles from shore. They decided to sail towards South America, but faced powerful trade winds that pushed them even farther into the ocean. Weeks went by without any progress whatsoever. The little provisions that they could scavenge were rationed, much of their bread and water was contaminated by salt water, which made it unable to be consumed. They soon ran out of provisions. One after the other, the men of the Essex began to die. As each man perished and resources were depleted, the remaining men gradually morphed into skeletons. Bodies piled up, and the survivors, overwhelmed with hunger, were left with no other choice but to turn to the unthinkable, cannibalism. All of the lifeboats found themselves in the same dire position. When the deaths began to slow down and no other source of food was available, the men agreed that they would draw straws to see who would be killed for food. Owen Coffin, the teenage cousin of Captain George Pollard who promised to protect him, was struck with the most unfortunate fate. Two weeks later, 93 days after the sinking of the Essex, the Nantucket whale ship, the Dauphin, discovered the men still gnawing on young Owen Coffin's bones. The men were so delusional that they were frightened by their saviors. Eight of the 20 men that set sail on the Essex in 1819 lived to return home. Captain George Pollard did not let this ordeal hinder his career. He continued to captain other ships, one of which wrecked off of Hawaii a few years later. The first mate, Owen Chase, settled on Nantucket with his family. Late in life, he went mad and began hiding food in his attic, which ultimately landed him in an insane asylum. The rest of the survivors retired to their calm island home in hopes of forgetting the unforgettable.
Each summer, I return to the island that stole my heart. While I am sometimes swept up in the natural beauty, the parties, and the lightheartedness in the air, I urge myself to remember that I walk the same steps as Owen Chase. I live a few doors down from the original home of the Coffin family. I swim in the same Nantucket Sound that saw the life and death of the amazing creatures that brought the island so many riches. And I ask myself, why am I so drawn to the story of the Essex? I think that I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe it's because I can't grasp how I am able to enjoy the benefits of such hardships that the island's forefathers endured. Or maybe I just don't think it's fair to allow the memory of such brave men to fade. I think that we can all learn a little bit about human triumph from the crew of the Essex. Because without them, my summer home just wouldn't be what it is today.